I don't want to be a product of my environment. I want my environment to be a product of me. Well, friends, I have a feeling that I really don't need to introduce our guest, given the way you've welcomed him, but it's a great moment for the Library of Alexandria to welcome the one and only Martin Scorsese. Uh, he is the, he is of course, you all know him as an American film director, screenwriter, producer, actor, critic, film historian. He's the founder of the World Cinema Foundation and a recipient of the AFI Life Achievement Award for his contributions to the cinema and has won every single award from the Oscars to the Golden Globes to BAFTA, Directors Guild of America. There's hardly anything that could be bestowed on someone in cinema that Mr. Scorsese hasn't won. He's also the president of the Film Foundation a non-profit organization dedicated to film preservation and the prevention of the decaying of motion picture film stock. Let me say for this audience in particular in Egypt how grateful we are to Martin Scorsese for having taken under his wing the great classic film of Shadi Abdel Salam Al Mumia. It is, it is very much thanks to him that that masterpiece has been restored. It was shown in Cannes, and Muhib al Nahas was there. And uh, we're now proud to welcome uh, uh, Martin Scorsese here. And it's my understanding that the film will also be made available for the first time in DVD. So many of you who have seen the film more of you young people who have just heard of the film of Shadi Abd Salam will be able to see it again, and that's thanks to him. But Martin Scorsese is not only a master of cinema, he has very much shaped the modern cinema. He is uh, certainly one of the most significant and influential filmmakers. He's made the landmark films that we all know, from Taxi Driver to Raging Bull, Goodfellas. He's won the best uh, uh, director Award for The Departed, but has been nominated many times. And, and I must tell you that it's fascinating to notice that he's on everybody's list of five greatest directors, ten greatest directors, no matter which list you look at, he is there. And he is frequently the only living director, living practicing director, on such lists. So, uh, ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Martin Scorsese. Thank you. Thank you so much, Martin. Very nice welcome. Thank you so much. I'm overwhelmed by uh, by this uh, extraordinary welcome. Well, you have, you have. <laughs> I told you, you have many, many fans here, and uh, so this is, uh, if anything, certainly not a hostile audience. <laughs> <laughs> Though actually, uh, you know, it's fascinating, wonderful to have you here with us, and uh, we often wonder when we admire the work of great artists and great people, uh, how you got started, what the beginnings were. And especially that in your case, I understand that uh, you uh, for a while thought about going into the priesthood and even entered the seminary mm -hmm. in 1956, uh -huh. but somehow went to NYU and did film instead. That's, yes. that's a long 
Paul. No, it was, <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> I, I think um, for me, uh, uh, <laughs> I guess I could be oversimplifying it, but I think um, when I was three years old, I uh, contracted asthma, and um, uh, I've been asthmatic all my life, and uh, my parents um, uh, weren't allowed to, I wasn't allowed to do any sports or, or anything like that, so they really didn't know what to do with me, so they brought me to a movie theater. <laughs> <laughs> and um, um, I then began going to Catholic school um, in, a, in the old Italian-American neighborhood in uh, downtown New York, downtown Manhattan, which was very insulated and very much, my area was Sicilian, all Sicilians. On the next block was all the people from Naples. Mm. And then they were Calabrese. <laughs> they were, there's another block. But um, uh, the teachers at the Catholic school were Irish nuns. <laughs> ah, well. So eventually, um, I became, um, uh, eventually what, what happened that the neighborhood was such a place that, that um, uh, one had to use, uh, if you weren't strong enough physically, you had to use your wits to survive. And so I began to understand that uh, um, a lot of uh, what I saw that was good in that area was not only coming from uh, the, the connection of the, 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 uh, uh, the sense of uh, family, of blood, but also from uh, two young priests um, who were there, who were maybe 22 years old, 23 years old, Italian-American priests who were very interesting and told us and looked at myself and my friends and said, you don't have to live like this. You could, you could use your head, get an education, and move out. And, and I used the, this one priest as a, uh, as a uh, mentor in a way. Um, but uh, quickly, by the time I was 15 or 16 years old in the seminary, I realized that one has to have more uh, of, a, of a, a will um, to uh, have a vocation to give yourself to other people as a, as a, as a priest would and should. And so I was expelled from the uh, <laughs> seminary, went to a Catholic school, and eventually wound up at uh, uh, New York University. And the passion that I, I had for uh, what I thought was uh, a passion for religion uh, sort of transferred over a passion for cinema. Um, because cinema was uh, not only the American cinema, but British and Italian cinema. And then by the late 50s, um, international cinema, particularly Sajit Ray and films from Japan. And so I began to learn about the outside world through cinema. You see, mm -hmm. um, if I was interested in Sajit Ray, I'd go, I found the Ravi Shankar album, the first one in America. Um, and um, it was interesting because where I lived was a tenement. So especially in the summer, all the doors were open and uh, people would hear each other's problems and uh, this sort of thing, arguments. You go and settle the neighbor's argument then you come back into your house and argue with your wife and, you know, <laughs> all of this going on. In the meantime, people are playing jazz, people are playing opera, people are playing rock and roll. You can hear it through the windows and I'm playing the Ravi Shankar. <laughs> so, so this became, became a change um, and eventually uh, I met a teacher uh, at New York University named Haig Minujian, who's Armenian-American, who had a very passionate man and who was a very, very tough teacher. And uh, he inspired me, like that priest did. And so inspired me to, uh, uh, to have the, uh, the energy and the, the determination to put what I thought I wanted to say on film and to use film. And don't forget, this is 1962. 63. At that point, there was the British New Wave, the French New Wave, the Italian New Wave of cinema coming from uh, Western Europe. And of course, the great Russian films, too. So this was a very exciting time. But Haig Manoujian, uh, you know, I, I believe you dedicated one of your films to Yes, him, Raging Bull. Yes. yes, he had just passed away. He never saw that film. So. Um, I, I, because Raging Bull, I put, by the time I did Raging Bull, it was 1980 or 79 or 80, and I just put everything I thought I knew or I thought I knew, <laughs> into the movie. And I thought that would be the last film I would do. Why the last film? I, I, I had the idea I would be doing documentaries after that. I was going to go to Italy and do documentaries on the uh, uh, religious subjects, uh, Lives of the Saints, uh, and that sort of thing. Mm, well, wonderful. At any rate, it's quite interesting because on the other side, you co-edited Woodstock, 
And Roger Corman uh, was very That's impressed the, uh, with you, and uh, uh, you worked uh, uh, with him a little bit, and then you did Boxcar Bertha in 72. But that was not enough, and it was really Mean Streets yes. in 73 that yeah. made all the difference, wasn't yeah. it? Yeah, no, the Mean Streets. Mean Streets was the film that is based on myself and my friends and uh, the Lower East Side. Um, and um, we shot that in 1972. That would, I learned from Roger Corman, who's getting an Academy Award this year for a lifetime achievement, because he had so many wonderful people working with him. We started with him, Francis Coppola, Jack Nicholson, Peter Fonda, Dennis Hopper, Monty Hellman, Peter Bogdanovich, all started with him. I, I, I came in a little later. And um, I learned how to make a film through Roger. What I mean by that is that I learned that we had, we had the crew and we had 24 days to shoot. That's it. And you did the hardest stuff first. And in the case of Boxcar Birth, there was everything with the train. I said, why do I have to shoot the trains first? Because that's the hardest thing. In four days, you'll be past the train, and then everything else will seem easy. <laughs> you know? But he was very right about that. And it, in his setups, he would do maybe 32 setups a day, 28 setups a day. So in America, it's very, very fast, very low budget. And I learned how to, um, I learned how the discipline of making a film. That is, um, when I did Who's That Knocking or my other films, we only did those when we had the camera. If we had the camera for that day, I'd call the actors, if they were still in New York. <laughs> and if they hadn't cut their hair, you know what I mean? Okay, guys, all of you who are interested in the film, now this you've is... heard Boxcar Bertha was done for less than $600,000, right. and uh, now you know, don't complain about not having enough budgets, etc. We'll challenge you to come up with masterpieces <laughs> the way the master did, with no money, no actors, no nothing, but he did it. <laughs> well, it was the preparation that I learned from uh, Roger Corman, how to prepare a film, how to prepare it. And uh, uh, so that even if everything went wrong, which it usually does, you had a plan that you can go back to. That was the key thing. So we did Mean Streets in the same way we did Boxcar Bertha, the same crew. But you had the... Uh, Robert De Niro and Harvey Keitel with you in Mean Streets, and that really was, uh, these actors will come back again and again in many of your yes. films. Well, Harvey Keitel I met in uh, 1964 for Who's That Knocking? Um, and I really, uh, Harvey and I, uh, Harvey and Bob De Niro and myself are sort of like... Uh, a trio, yeah. <laughs> yeah, uh, uh, like brothers in a way. My mother used to say they're her other sons, you know. <laughs> and, um, but Harvey stayed with me. Harvey played the same character in Who's That Knocking? And he played the same character in Mean Streets. Um, and then I met De Niro through Brian De Palma, the great yes. director. And uh, actually, De Niro and I knew each other when we were 15 years old. He would be with a different group of uh, young uh, Italian-American uh, kind of tough guys over at another two blocks away from where we were. And we didn't really socialize, but we remembered him I remembered him as being a very sweet young man. He was about 15 or 16. Um, uh, hanging out with pretty, pretty rough crowds at that time. Um, and so when we got to meet each other later in 1970, he said, I know you and I know who you used to be with, friends with. And he mentioned some names. And um, I said, yes, yes, how did you know? He said, I'm so-and-so. And I didn't realize I'm <laughs> Bobby. Uh, I didn't realize. So he wanted to make Mean Streets badly with me, although he wanted to play Harvey's part. I said, no, 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 you must play the Johnny Boy part. No. Yes. <laughs> and he knew the characters it was based on. He knew the characters in reality. So he could draw on that experience Yeah, as well, but yeah. He, also, he also knew those streets, and he knew it very well. I didn't know that his, um, his background, of course, is very different. His background, his father's a famous painter, his mother too. They came from uh, a Bohemian background. My parents are working class Italian-Americans working in the garment district. My father was a presser. My mother was the operating, the sewing machines. So it's a very, very different uh, intellectual background. But uh, by that time, after Mean Streets, you'd been about 10 years in the movie business, and uh, in one way or another. And uh, I think we would all be interested to sort of probe a little bit uh, the influences upon you. Uh, because uh, you uh, have been quoted as saying that uh, your favorite films were uh, Citizen Kane, The Red Shoes, and The Leopard. Uh, although uh, one would imagine from seeing your work that uh, above and beyond uh, Citizen Kane's, uh, yeah. Wells's A Touch of Evil, uh, Hitchcock, 
would have been uh, important influences well, as well. Cassavetes was the main, John Cassavetes. John Cassavetes. Is uh, the main one, yeah. Well, uh, do you allow the free-form type of work that John Cassavetes I does? I, I, don't, <laughs> I, can't, I can't do what he did, but he liked my first film, Who's That Knocking, a great deal. He was a yes. great, he became a mentor. He's the one who told me after seeing Boxcar Bertha. He said, you just spent, you spent, a, he said, he smiled, he hugged me, and he said, you spent a year of your life making a piece of junk. <laughs> now, you do better than that. He said, you can make a better picture than that. Don't you have something you want to do? I said, yeah, it's called Mean Streets. He said, get the, get the script and go and do it. And he was very, very supportive, especially a Raging Bull. Um, and the, um, uh, when he did his, you see, when Cassavetes did Shadows in 1958, 59, in 16 millimeter black and white, he just broke open all the barriers. Uh, there were no more excuses for young people saying, oh, we can't get the money to make a film. He didn't need money. In a sense, you stole the film. You, you took a camera from somebody. You worked with the actors. You improvised. He improvised. But the improvisations all worked out the way I liked to do them myself, if I had the time the right way, would be to improvise with the actors, write it into a script, work from that. That was the idea. And that, you see that in Mean Street. You yes. see it in... Raging Bull, you certainly see it in Goodfellas. <laughs> uh, well, we'll come back to yeah, Goodfellas yeah, yeah. in Goodfellas a moment. A lot. But, but then shortly thereafter, I think uh, uh, another big break after Mean Streets was uh, Alice Doesn't Live Here Anymore in 1974 yes, they, because yes. Ellen Burstyn went on to a Best Actress Award yes. and you, you took it, you received it for her. Right? Yes. Well, Frances Coppola was um, talking to Ellen Burstyn and she had just been in a film called The Exorcist and uh, uh, she was up for Academy Award and didn't win it. Um, Frances, uh, she had this script by Robert Getchell, Alice Doesn't Live Here Anymore, and she said, who are the, who are the new young filmmakers? And Frances said, this kid, Morty Scorsese, uh, I like, you should see his movie, Mean Streets. And then the head of the studio, John Kelly, met with me because he bought Mean Streets from Warner Brothers. He was the head of Warner Brothers. And uh, he looked at me and he said, this is a script you should do because they said you can't direct women. <laughs> Woo! I said, all right, I'm looking at a good script. It was a good script. We improvised some of that, too, with uh, Ellen and uh, Diane Ladd and Chris Christopherson. Yeah. But it was a very good script. Getchell's script was excellent. And I learned a lot from making that film. Um, and it uh, sort of opened the door for studio filmmaking for me. Well, in studio filmmaking, uh, the uh, films immediately after that, New York, New York, and The Last Waltz, somehow uh, seemed like a... Uh, a a brief uh, 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 holding pattern until you, you, you explode again with Raging Bull, which mm -hmm. I think almost everybody considers uh, one of the very best movies of all time. Uh, what was so special about Jake LaMotta that uh, made you desire uh, to do something about Jake LaMotta? It was LaMotta's? De Niro's idea. It was Robert De Niro who kept pushing me to make that film. I didn't want to make it. I don't know anything about boxing. I'm, I'm, it doesn't, it doesn't I'm seem asthma, like, I, a, I mean, that doesn't I'm, seem like don't work do any of someone who wasn't motivated to do the work. Come on, Marty. <laughs> I didn't realize, I didn't realize until, until, until I spent about three years behaving uh, uh, in a bad, you know, in a crazy way in Hollywood and making, I made New York, New York, an interesting film, but a failure. For, as, for me, I considered it a failure. I was, I felt that when I did Last Waltz, I felt I was onto something again. But again, that's the music of the band and Bob Dylan and, and Van Morrison and Neil Young and Muddy Waters. That's not my work, but it's, it's the way they were captured on stage and the way the film was edited. And I thought I was back on track. I needed something to really feel passionate about. And the last one that I felt passionate about, of course, was Mean Streets and Taxi Driver. Taxi Driver was a key film. Paul Schrader's script was so... Uh, again, Brian De Palma gave me that script. He said, this is something you should do. And so the team of De Niro Scorsese was able to get that, that film made. But even in those days, in the 70s, where they say that the director had all that power in Hollywood, we could not get that picture made. Michael and Julia Phillips, the producers, uh, had just won the Academy Award for Best Picture, The Sting, a picture yeah. called The Sting with Paul yeah. Newman and, and Robert yeah. Redford. They couldn't get it made until they, they somehow, they got me with Mean Streets and De Niro with Mean Streets and De Niro did Godfather II. They put us together again. And that's how we got a million dollars to make um, Taxi Drive. Uh, Taxi Drive was made for a million dollars? Oh yeah, yeah, it was made very quickly. And uh, that was a real passion project. Uh, and after that was released, it, I didn't think it was going to be seen by anyone. 
I, I made it for just for the love of it. I, I didn't know that it was a picture that many people would, would uh, react very strongly to. So it was a big, it was a big success uh, for that type of film. And um, so I experimented with New York, New York. I didn't feel the experiment worked. Maybe it did, but I, I'm not quite sure. I can't tell. I'm too close to it. And so I was looking for a, a, a real passion project to make, which um, became Gangs of New York, ultimately. Uh, the gang, but that took many, many years. But we, we had the script, but we couldn't get it financed. In the meantime, De Niro was telling me, come on, we're going to do this boxing film. I'm going to gain 60 pounds. I'm working out. Let's do this. And I'm going to lose. I'm getting older. If I, lose, uh, if I gain 60 pounds, um, and, you know, as you get older, it's harder to get the pounds off. Oh, right? <laughs> we, we're younger. We didn't think. Oh, don't worry about it. No, no. Uh, so, so eventually, I, I remember I just collapsed, and I was in a hospital, in New York Hospital. And uh, it was Labor Day weekend, 1978, September. And De Niro came to visit me. And this is after two years of working on the script and trying. Paul Schrader came in and worked yep. on a, a version of the script. And De Niro uh, told me, he said, come on, come on, what are you, what are you trying to prove? He said, what are you, what, what's the point? What's the point of killing yourself? He said, come on, get out of bed and come and make this film with me. You'd be, you'd be best at making this film. And I just found myself, I had reached a point in my life where there was nothing more for me to do but to go and make that film. And I said, yes. And so he, he took me to an island, um, which again, I'm not a, um, uh, I'm an urban person. I don't, I don't necessarily uh, <laughs> go to islands and that sort of thing. But this way he knew, he knew I'd be in a room, a big suite, and I'd be working with him on the script. So, and we were in that, uh, there from that island for two and a half weeks, and we came back with a new version of the script. And uh, producers put it together. And the film was finally completed. And that's why I thought I'd finally said all I could say in movies. And I, I, I thought my next picture would be Gangs in New York, and we couldn't get that financed. Yeah, that's, uh, well, of course, all of us who admire your work are very happy that uh, this was not your last movie no. by a long <laughs> shot. But uh, uh, that raises uh, a, a, a question that I have is Raging Bull uh, is an amazing uh, uh, film. It won uh, many nominations and certainly two Oscars. But uh, it also uh, had some of the most difficult uh, violence in very slow motion when they're in the ring. Mm. And you get the feeling that somehow this is the time when we were, at least for most people in, like me in the audience, the closest to imagining what it would be like well, to that, be in the ring. Well, that's what I thought, because I hadn't really uh, been a fight fan, because in the old days, when they would show a, a fight on American television, for example, my father and all his brothers and everybody would be watching the fight, and they, there'd be these two little figures on black and white screen. I couldn't see who was who. I don't know. <laughs> unless I had white trunks or black trunks, I couldn't tell. <laughs> And, I, and then you couldn't see the punches. I couldn't, with little figures. And it would go on for days, it seemed like ages. And then um, there would be the championship fights, like, uh, uh, oh God, uh, uh, Joe Lewis' last fight, I remember. Uh, an amazing fight. But they would show the, sh the, the, the championship was not televised. It was on the radio. So then everybody in the neighborhood who had money on the game and uh, all these guys who were gambling, eventually, they'd all wind up in the theater on Saturday afternoon when we were kids and we wanted to see a Western or whatever movie, we had to wait the entire 15 rounds of, of, of a fight that we knew who was going to win. See? So for me, it was just like torture. I had no idea. You couldn't feel the power of the, of the boxers, the way it was photographed. And uh, I remember doing some research, going backstage, and just some guys limbering up and working. And the speed of, a, of a one fist going past me was like, like, a, like a jet plane. It was an extraordinary thing. I said, what if, what if, the, and then I was watching, I was in the hospital at uh, that time in, in September, and that was the fight of Muhammad Ali and um, Leon Spinks, the second fight. Yeah. And Muhammad Ali was winning. And I'm watching this fight, I'm watching it, and, and, and the, the coverage of it, it was better, of course. But they had, for the first time, a microphone in the corner of Muhammad Ali. And he's winning the fight. At one point, I hear him say, as the, ring, the, the bell rings, and he goes and he sits in the corner. I hear him say, uh, what round is it? And I tell him, he said, am I winning? He says, yeah, you're winning. As it gets back up, he, says, he had no idea where he was. And I yes. said, this must be interesting. I said, to be 
to perceive. What do you perceive? What do you hear? What do you hear? When you're, you know, when, when you're, you're in that, that square, that, and then should it be a square? What if we stretch the square? Which is what we did. Sometimes it's, it's enormous, sometimes it's tiny. We, we kept rebuilding it, you see. And that's the only way I, um, I felt we could show the fighting was always from the, in the inside. There's only one fight from the outside, and that's the fight from outside the, the ropes, and that's the fox fight. And that fight is the only one that Jake LaMotta claimed that he, he threw, he, he threw. Uh, faked the fight. So I figured we should be outside the, the ropes. And another interesting thing I always felt was that at first, when I was, before we went to the island, before I, I didn't want to make the film, De Niro was talking me into it, uh, I met Norman Mailer a few times. And Mailer was a great fight fan. He was a fighter. And Mailer would tell me these stories about Jake LaMotta. He was good friends with Jake. And um, I said, well, I'm going to make the whole film, but there's not going to be any fight scenes. And he said, no, no, that's the point. He said, you have to show Jake fighting. Jake was a great fighter. So I said, oh, God, if I ever make this film, I have to show a fight scene. How the hell am I going to do that? So I had never seen these fights. And later on, once De Niro took me out of the hospital and we went there, then I saw some fights and I began to realize how to, how to do them. And uh, two years later, or three years later, uh, uh, at a dinner, I met Mr. Mailer again. And I said, Norman, I said, uh, because of you, I put the fight scenes in the pictures. That's the only stuff in the film I didn't like. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm no Norman Mailer, but that's the... Part of him that has most Typical. impressed me, I think. It's a very, very impressive. You can't. Uh, that very, very impressive. Yeah, you can't win them all. You can't win them all. But, <laughs> bastard, you're just... but Martin, you... Genius, a genius, but oh, God. You but know, without him, without him telling me that, I never would have done it. Well, I'm, I'm glad because I think, uh, you know, we're all glad that you did it because it's really one of the milestones <laughs> of cinema. And, uh, and uh, I, I'm just curious, I think, or many of us would be curious to know more about how you choose a topic for a film. In this case, you said a friend brought it to you, but uh, you did the King of Comedy, you did After Hours, and you did also The Color of Money with Paul Newman. Oh, yeah. Now, yeah. this was a case where uh, you picked, uh, this is not quite, this is not a remake, like, uh, like it's a uh, Cape Fear, it's a sequel. It's a sequel, yeah. Right? And you picked Fast Eddie Felsen out of The yeah. Hustler, you got Paul Newman to play that link, and then there's a young Tom Cruise with it, and so on. What was it that attracted you to do uh, to invent a, a, a sequel with with uh, with uh, the Paul Newman character so many years later? Well, um, it was the first time I'd really worked with a, um, a film star, uh, an actor, and a film star. Prior to that. Um, everyone I worked with were uh, either my own age or friends of mine or Ellen Burstyn, who was a theater actress, Chris Christopherson, who was a musician, a poet. Uh, it was a different kind of thing. But here was the first time, and Paul Newman had written me a very nice letter about Raging Bull. And so um, Mike Ovitz, the uh, super agent at the time, put us together. And uh, I liked the idea of the milieu of the pool hall. Not necessarily the game. But it's the outwitting of the other person, the, uh, the, uh, the huckster, the, uh, the hustler. The, the original film, The Hustler, is a beautiful film. It is. You know? and, uh, and so I thought maybe I could do something with that world, and we could take that character of Eddie Felsen and bring him up to date. And I got Richard Price, who's a wonderful writer, uh, excellent novelist. And uh, the three of us got together, Paul Newman and Richard Price and myself, and worked out this, this idea. But, Paul wasn't so happy about doing it. He, he felt none of the, a lot of films don't deserve sequels. But the part, the film was shaped around him so nicely that he finally, um, he finally acquiesced and, and we did that. The other projects that were um, uh, sometimes presented to me, let's say uh, De Palma would give me a taxi driver because he felt that I was good for that material. Um, and uh, uh, De Niro would give me and force me to do Raging Bull or King of Comedy because in a way they, they kind of, uh, De Niro, the relationship with him is very close, so he kind of knows me better sometimes than I know myself. <laughs> so. <laughs> so he can tell what will really ultimately be yeah, well in yeah, yeah. But, uh, but this was a, a color of money was a, 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 an attempt to, I wanted to make Last Temptation of Christ. And um, Gangs of New York couldn't get made. The whole industry had changed. 1980, everything collapsed uh, with Heaven's Gate. Uh, yes, Michael and, Cimino's. Yeah, Michael Cimino's film, which is a, a beautiful film in uh, many, many ways, but at that time it cost too much money. I was at the same studio 
United Artists. In fact, we opened Raging Bull 10 days before Heaven's Gate. So we went down. Everything went down with it. And uh, uh, I couldn't do Gangs in New York, and uh, Paul Schrader and I got together. We worked on Last Temptation of Christ, and we were about to do that. And it was, I remember scouting locations and casting the film in 1983, and then at the last minute it was canceled from different pressures. And so everything between 1983 and 1988, I was doing to get back in shape to do the pictures that I, I really wanted to do was Last Temptation, Goodfellas, and that sort of thing. And Color and, of Money falls into that category. And, and uh, while you were, I mean, um, it's, you've also been quoted as saying that there were three films that you really wanted to do for many, many years, uh, Last Temptation, Gangs of New York, and something about Dean Martin. Oh, Dino. Dean Martin, well? The Dean Martin biopic, uh, we, Dino, we, right? we, tried, we tried with Dino for about three years. We could not, Put it we couldn't get Dean. <laughs> Dean's a slippery man. He just, he had that attitude. He'd just fly away, you know. Yeah, Every time you thought you had him, he was gone. He was gone. <laughs> Didn't but, get him. But let's stop for a moment at, uh, at what is arguably your most controversial film, The Last Temptation of Christ, which was a film you wanted to do and uh, which uh, for many people is an absolute masterpiece but has also uh, gotten a lot of publicity at different points in time. Mm -hmm. At the time it came out, there were people who were negative about it in the Catholic Church, uh, or church, but then ultimately today with the passage of time, there's a, a much greater appreciation mm -hmm. of what the movie says. And uh, the, the uh, dream sequences and the Satan that comes as an angel and shows uh, uh, Jesus uh, uh, the potential. But the thing that struck me as strange for somebody who was brought up in a, in a, in a Catholic school is the, the presentation of uh, Judas hmm. as, uh, as uh, intelligent, all-knowing, almost all-knowing. Well, this is the outcast. A, a this very, is, very this unusual is, presentation yeah, of Judas. The, Judas is a fascinating character because, I mean, it's cousin Zacchaeus. Yes. Nikos Kazintzakis, is the, it's his book, and it's his, his take on the old gospel of Judas, yes. I guess, and many different things. But we thought it was interesting because I guess for me, I remember growing up in uh, the Lower East Side, which, as I said, was very strongly bound together by family, but also uh, working-class people trying to make a good life, but also there was an under underworld um, of, of um, American underworld that was there, or Italian underworld. And um, the worst thing that you could do, the worst offense, was betray. Was the betrayal. And what is the essence of this betrayal? What is it in every human being that we may be capable of betraying the ones we love, maybe? We don't know. Um, and therefore, this is what interested me in Judas, because it turns out Judas is not the betrayer. Judas is the one, without him, Jesus can't go through the sacrifice. I'm talking as a Catholic, mm. see, or as a... As a, as a Catholic, particularly a Catholic from the American Catholic Church of the early 50s. Um, and these are the thoughts that went through our heads all the time. We said, well, what if, what if Cousin Zacchaeus? It's an interesting idea. If Jesus, when Jesus tells Judas, uh, Judas, Judas says, I, I, can't, I can't betray you. It's the worst thing I can think of. I, I can never betray you. And uh, Jesus tells him, that's why he gave me the easier job to be crucified. Yes. Uh, and this is the very interesting Jesus. It's a very interesting Jesus, too, in terms of uh, Shushako Endo's book, Silence, the great um, Japanese yes. uh, Christian author, which is another passion project I hope one day uh, to, we're preparing now to try to shoot it. I cast the film in Japan this year. Um, but it's about uh, two um, Portuguese missionaries who go back into Japan in the 17th century to administer to the Japanese Christians who are outlawed. Uh, and of course, they're caught by the authorities and uh, they're questioned and uh, tortured and put to, the, to, put to the point of, should they apostatize? Should they give in? And then ultimately, is it about them or is it about compassion? Is it the feminine side of Jesus, which is what Endo was talking about, the nurturing side, the side that, that is loving and compassionate, or the tougher side? And this is an interesting question. This is based on a true story, too. Yes. Uh, uh, Father the Ferrara, his name was. The, the Portuguese missionaries in Japan, of course, were the early part, and there was one 
Englishman who came in the early 17th century, and that was the basis for Jim Clavel's uh, Shogun. Oh, the Shogun, yes, yes. of course, yes. Yeah. And there were, the Portuguese missionaries were there yes, at the that's time, right. but then afterwards with the, with the uh, Takagawa regime, they, they outlawed uh, yes. uh, and then they suffered, tremendously. Yeah. Yeah. they suffered tremendously. But so this was, this was a project you wanted to do from a long time. Was it, was it that you were moved by the novel of Kazantzakis or? I think, I think by the Kazantzakis, but, but also, you see, I still, I still had very much in me, I, I guess, trying to work out my feelings about the essence of the religion, of the religion I, I, I perceived. I don't say I was taught. It's how I perceived what was around me. Uh, by the nuns, and particularly by certain priests. And uh, I just needed to make sense of it, I thought. And these are questions we all had about the, yeah. the if Jesus uh, is, uh, is uh, Christologically correct in the sense that it has to be fully God and fully man in Catholic and Christian sense, then one a, has to experience all those things that are human. Now, how does he deal Including with it? Including dreaming of temptation. Yeah. yeah. Right. And, and, uh, at any rate, uh, that's what great art is all about. It engages one emotionally and intellectually, and we go back to it again and again and think more about right, it every right. time. But uh, you left, uh, after having done The Last Temptation of Christ, you still would have quite a while before you'd get to The Gangs of New York, your second oh. movie, but you did Goodfellas. Now, yes. this is another absolutely milestone movie. And uh, it uh, it's, uh, would be interesting to know uh, what prompted you to, to do... That book, uh, the, um, the Nick Pileggi's book. book, Nicholas Pileggi's Nick Pileggi is a wonderful uh, uh, writer, nonfiction writer and uh, investigative reporter um, who has the trust of many of these characters over the years, and many of these real under, underworld characters. They trust him, they love him, uh, they tell him, and Nick never says a word. I don't know, you can ask him a question, he'll never tell you. Somehow it'll wind up in a book somewhere. Uh, but in the case of this particular book, Wise Guy it was called. And we had to change the name because it was a TV series called Wise Guy. And so um, the book was interesting because it had a character that was a, a soldier. He wasn't a lieutenant, he wasn't a general, he wasn't a, a capo de tutti mafiosi. He was, not, he was not the top level man. He was a young guy. Who was, who was seduced by, um, yes. by materialism, by, by what the mob can offer, and the respect, mainly, more than materialism, the respect, and uh, uh, without education or anything. And so um, the danger of the, of the story is about the, uh, the allure, the allure of, of crime and uh, the, uh, the, um, the temptation, in a sense, of that life of crime and the rewards it gives you. But at a certain point in the picture, it all changes. They have to start to pay. And yes. that's not because there's a film code the way they used to be in the old days. Crime does not pay. In many cases, we know that people do get away with crime. But the point is, <laughs> in this case, a lifestyle. The film is more about a lifestyle. It's like a documentary, in a way. Um, and so I said, the only way to do this film is to do it like, oh, to do it like um, some of the young men that I, some of the young boys I grew up with would be standing on a street corner telling you a story. Mm. They go fast, they move, they move, they yes. move. They know when to give you the punchline. They know how to tell the joke. They know how to, they know self-deprecating humor. Yeah. They understand when they should take the back seat in the story. And they were brilliant storytellers and actors um, because they have to survive in the street. And so I said, that's the movie. That's how we should do it. And I said, also, it should have the pace of the first three minutes of Jules et Jim. By Truffaut. Yeah. First three or four minutes. Very one, two, three, four, one. And uh, it, it becomes later becomes fueled by a uh, drug, a drug use, a chemical pace. Then it starts become, going. Then it just explodes. Yeah. Then it explodes and starts yeah, going yeah. Oh, yeah. haywire. And, and but the pace is very fast. But it conveys a kind of chaotic feeling at the last. Well, it day. can't hold everything together. I mean, yeah. uh, you know, things are falling apart. Totally, and, and, totally. And, because and the, and the intercutting. Shows it's a, it. it's about that lifestyle, and and ultimately in that lifestyle, as I said, there's two things that happen: either you wind up dead or you wind up in jail, and then you come out of jail, you go back in jail. Then you yeah. come out of jail, you go back in jail. That's it. That that's what eventually happens. I mean, for particularly his foot, the foot soldier, in a sense. And it's about the street corner life, really. Um, uh, what I mean by that is it's not about the, uh, 
these uh, supposedly these these the big dons the big and dons and this I don't know the, you know I don't know any of that I just know what it's like on on, on the street level but but on that street level you captured I think with uh, with again Bob De Niro and uh, Ray Liotta but you also have Joe Pesci oh, who's, Joe. Yeah. who does a a a, a sociopath. Uh, well, one almost would swear that he really is. <laughs> well, he's... He, he, he gets, is? He, gets, <laughs> <laughs> he, so he based that. He wasn't acting, you mean? <laughs> Just well, he, he, his mind. One of the times he isn't acting in there, but he based that on a friend of his who's now in jail <laughs> and who's really mad at him for doing it. Uh, but you can see him working with my mother, for example. My mother yeah. plays his mother in the film. Yeah. So they improvise the whole thing about this knife. They said, can I have that knife? And he said, yeah. no. says, remember, it has to come back here. And it goes back and forth. But my mother, the, this is the storyteller. She was a great storyteller. So I gave her two lines, Nick Pelleggi and I gave her two lines of dialogue. And we said, uh, and it's Bob. Your son comes home at 4 o'clock in the morning with his friends, with uh, Jimmy and with, uh, with this young kid, Henry. And you want to feed him right away, give him food. He said, right. It's four o'clock in the morning. You haven't seen him in two days, three days. Right, okay. So I put two cameras down, and that was it. She just took over with Joe, and they improvised all of that, working together in that scene. She did not know that they had a, a body in the trunk of the car. Yeah. She got mad at me she, later she, when she... <laughs> she didn't know what they were going to use the knife for. <laughs> she didn't, she know, didn't know what they were going to use the knife for either. I mean, that's... <laughs> So that was, uh, that was uh, really true. Cool. So in fact, it was, uh, there was improvisation in that. Uh, a great deal of it, yes. Yeah, and, and also in uh, Do You Think I'm Funny, that Joe Pesci, what he does with, uh, uh, with Ray Liotta, he says, Do yes. You Think I'm Funny, Why Am I a Clown? That actually happened to Joe in reality. But he was on the other side. Yeah, he was on the other side. He, <laughs> he was on Henry's side. He was on Henry's side. He said, I'll do the film if you let me do the scene. I said, okay, I'll do the scene if we work it out in rehearsal and we write it down based on different takes, and which is what we did. We wrote it down, and uh, we just shot two cameras, no close-ups, uh, because the issue was that the nature of how the mood changes is reflected in all the people around uh, Henry, not just a close-up of Henry, it's everybody's body language behind him. They all yeah. start to move around like this, people get nervous, so you have to see all of that. And we shot that very quickly, that scene, I remember, but that was really Joe's uh, experience. I said, it's, it's incredible, we should do it. Well, you, you mentioned, of course, that your mom played uh, in that kitchen scene with the knife, but uh, you yourself uh, have acted several times, and if I uh, recall, in, uh, in you played the gunman at the finale of Mean Streets, oh, that was, the yeah. cab passenger planning to kill his wife in taxi driver. Oh, yeah, yeah. That's not something very nice. <laughs> I know. No, these are, these are films, dreams, you know. Is a, you just appear in them. Uh, you know, my daughter's here tonight. She's, 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 she's 10 years old. She, she, she has not seen any of these films. She can't see any of them. <laughs> not until yet, maybe. not yet, not yet. <laughs> but, uh, but when you grow up, you will have a treasure <laughs> trove to watch. Your father has shaped our consciousness, uh, all of us collectively. The, the, the taxi driver one was uh, an accident because the man who was supposed to play the part got hurt uh, in an accident. And uh, there was nobody there. It was the last week of shooting. And... Bob and I, we all talked, he said, Marty, why don't you do it? And so I said, yes. And he was the only one who really believed in it, Bob. He, he believed, uh, other people saying, don't do it, Marty. And I said, well, I'll try it. I said, because I used, I, I couldn't find any other actors. We were going very, we were four days over schedule. And on a million dollar film at that time, that was, that was a, lot of, a lot of days over. And we were, they were getting a lot of pressure. So we just had to move. And so I did that. I didn't know that um, the scene would turn out that way. Hi. Turned out great, I think. Let me let me ask you then. It seems to me that uh, you know, if we look at the at the uh, body of other films, and I'll come back to some questions um, from *Bringing Out the Dead*, *Gangs of New York*, *The Aviator*, *The Departed*. And we're not going to ask about uh, uh, the, the Shutter Island because oh, Shutter that's, Island. Still, that's yeah. still coming, yeah. right? That's in yes, February. In February, February yeah. 2010, we have a big treat uh, ahead of us. Uh, but I wanted to to understand. Uh, better, you know, when you start, when you start with a project, sometimes you have an idea that you wanted to do, Gangs and Temptation and Dino being three mm -hmm. such examples. Sometimes somebody brings you 
mm -hmm. a, a script that you like. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, sometimes uh, it's, a, it's a character. I mean, like Eddie, Eddie Felsen was the character. The character, that purely the character. Like, yeah, or was it the, the idea of doing something with uh, uh, Rob, uh, Paul Newman, for example? Uh, the character, but it happened to be perfect because it was Paul, Paul Newman's character. And also, if I was able to do the picture on budget, in budget, within budget, for a Hollywood studio, uh, and on schedule, I would re... Um, I would um, uh, gain more credence. My credibility would come back, having been way over budget and schedule on Raging Bull and King of Comedy. Hmm. And so I had to prove to the studio again that I can make a picture with, uh, with uh, major stars, major actors, uh, that would be within budget and schedule. And that, was, that all determined. It took about a year to work on the script, though, to get that right. And so very often it's the, the script like Aviator, for example, was given to me after doing Gangs of New York because I had this, after doing Gangs, so much was, I wanted to make that film for so many years that I said, now I could go make a film that I might, how should I put it, sort of enjoy the process of filmmaking uh, because there's still, for me, the obsession of watching one image be put next to the other, whether it's edited on film or digital or whatever, and seeing it move. I, I still, it's almost like a, it has to, I have to continue doing it. And so I was lucky to find these projects. But when you do a, a project like uh, a script, you choose a script, now do you select the actors based on the script or do you work with them? I mean, two examples you gave, you really worked with the actors on forming the script and yes. you moved it in. So you really had selected the actors before the script was totally finalized. Mm -hmm. Some were joint projects when mm -hmm. you mentioned the Bob De Niro. So it's not saying, well, here's a novel or whatever it is, and here's now the script and the storyboards, and now who's the best person to play this role and that role, and you don't go around scouting for them. In fact, we notice that you have uh, almost a team around you, not just uh, uh, you have Michael Ballhaus as the, as, the, mm -hmm. as the photographer, cinematographer, you have uh, Thelma in the, in the, in yes. the, in the editing, the editing yes. and, it, it, and some of the same team of uh, actors. Is it uh, that uh, you are all alike, or is it that you're very different and complementary, or is it that you've just built a coherent team, a cohesive team, and you want to stay with it time and again? I think, I think the personalities are similar, um, or at least the personalities for myself and Thelma, it's been 35 years editing together, um, and uh, she knows me very, very well. Uh, and she understands my, my nature and, and she also is dedicated to the film. Even if I start to slip and say, uh, I, don't, I think maybe we should try this or that, she'll do it. But she says, don't forget, don't give in. Never give in to the outside forces. Mm. She's very, very powerful that way. Don't give in to them. Um, uh, constructively. Constructive. Uh, because you do get a battering from, you're, you're dealing with a lot of money from the studios. It is their investment. And they do have a say, and you have to argue this out. You have to argue your point and make, prove that, you, that w it would work or you think it would work. Um, d directors of photography, I find that I, 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 like, I usually work with people who are uh, Michael Ballhaus uh, and uh, Bob Richardson lately over the years, Michael Chapman on Taxi Driver. We had a wonderful uh, personal relationship mm. uh, and good sense of humor. Very That's good sense really of humor. Um, but with the actors is the key. The actors are the key. And uh, I find that the actors uh, were very similar. Keitel, De Niro, and myself were similar people. We, we express it differently, but we're similar. And also Leo DiCaprio. DiCaprio is attracted to the same themes and ideas. I'm 30 years older than him, but it's, um, I've been very uh, blessed by having worked with him four times, and in particular this new film, Shutter Island, to see his, uh, his level of acting in this picture. Uh, but because he, he, he's not afraid to take the chances and, uh, yeah. and uh, he'll, he'll go to those strange, difficult places. Uh, and it's, uh, I, I admire that greatly. Indeed, I, I, uh, I was about to ask you that question, but you partly answered it. It was the fact that uh, since film is really such a collective enterprise and you have uh, the, the, the script writer, you mentioned Paul Schrader and others who played a great role in that, you have the actors, you have the photographer, and you have the editor. And uh, I was going to ask you, in, in your creative process, who plays uh, uh, the biggest role next to you? And uh, you were saying more or less the actor. Is that the correct? actors, I think, yeah. I mean, in a script by Paul Schrader, you don't change. I mean, Paul's uh, very precise. 
Paul is very precise. Paul saw his first movie at the age of 18. Films were forbidden to him. He was part of the Calvinist religion. Um, and the first films he saw were by Robert Bresson. So he is very, very... I mean, we improvise only two scenes in uh, Taxi Driver. The one in the mirror, are you talking to me? And one little scene with Keitel, I think, uh, with De Niro and Keitel talking to each other outside a, uh, a front really? room. The rest, the rest is all written and, by Paul. We, we didn't touch including that. Including the last scene where he looks into the rearview mirror? The rearview mirror, I, I, I did. Is that... You, uh, yes. see, I, yeah. I knew that wasn't from the script. Yeah. You had I to couldn't that. help it, yeah. You had to do that. So, I had to, so yeah. it really came yeah. from you, not from... from, yeah. from but in Schreiter. Raging Bull, we changed it. Paul Schrader, Paul Schrader in Raging Bull was interesting. He pulled together a script. We had worked with another gentleman for two years. It wasn't working. We asked him to do it. And he said, I'll do you the favor, he said, because he was directing his own films by that point. He didn't want to do right for other people. He, you know, he had his own stuff to do. So he, um, he said, I'll work on it for six weeks. And he did. And at the end of six weeks, he gave, he gave us a very interesting script, but not exactly what Bob felt was right. I, at that point, was still not determined whether I wanted to make the film or not. It was before I was hospitalized, before I, I'd collapsed from uh, uh, pneumonia and that sort of thing. Um, and uh, what he did, though, was this. When I finally got out of the hospital, he said to, he had a meeting with us. He was going off to direct his own film. I think it was American Gigolo, I think. In any event, or maybe the Cat People remake. But in any event, he said, you take the script. He said, do what you have to do with it. Change it here, change it if you want that. He said, I would combine these characters. He gave us some directions, and we went off and, and rewrote that, completely improvised it and, mm -hmm. on the island together, yeah. De Niro and I. But in the case of Bringing Out the Dead, again, that was word for word with Schrader, based on a novel by Joe Connolly. It's a very interesting uh, novel. Um, and uh, so certain writers, uh, uh, one has to, or in the case of Age of Innocence, for example, yeah. the language there is very important. Well, I, I was going to come back to Age of Innocence and Cape Fear, because these are two remakes. Yes. I mean, they were films that were made before, and uh, you made them again. When you do a remake, like, say, Cape Fear, let's take Cape Fear for a moment, uh, how obligated do you feel to the original material, or how do you want to distance yourself from it? Well, that's a good question on Cape Fear. I didn't want to make that film either. <laughs> this again is Robert De Niro, Spielberg. The whole thing well, went on. I have, uh, I have a question on say. Cape Fear, and, and the question I have on Cape Fear is that uh, seeing the rest of your work, I find somehow the, the last part on the boat. Yes, I right? agree. It's, it's I not agree. really your Absolutely. style. It's well, not what, your style. <laughs> well, that was my attempt in 1991. Don't forget, we're talking 18, 19 years ago. I was trying at that time to see where American cinema was going and if I could go in that direction, if I would be comfortable in that direction, which is the three or four endings, the fighting that goes on continually, the character who doesn't die and goes on and on. And somehow I had to see if I could also do a storm scene. Mm. A big storm <laughs> sequence, seriously. Because normally my films are done, you know. But the, what happened there was De Niro really wanted to play that part of Max Cady. And I told him one night, it was with Steven Spielberg, I said, but I hate the script. I said, the script is... I said, Steve, you, Steven does certain things with a script like this that he could really... The family was very happy. They were singing. I, they were singing by, with a piano. I said, I, I can't... I, I, I'm sure that... That happens in life, but I don't experience that. I don't know. That's you know, not my experience. Not my experience. So I said, I said, so he looked at me, Steve, and said, and he looked at me, Steve, and he said, well, if you don't like the script, you could change it. I said, ah. And he said, let me ask you one, one question. I said, yeah. He said, at the end of the film, does the family live? I said, of course. He said, well, then do anything you want up to there. <laughs> that was the key. And so what we started with was a scene with De Niro and the young girl in school. That, see, that's that the was key. the, that to me and was that, where you had the most tension and the most fear. That, that's the whole film. That's and the whole that's, film. that's the whole picture for us. We started there, I said, in the original film, which is a very good film, um, that scene in, in the script that Steve had and Bob, they all had this script, where there was, um, De Niro was chasing this little girl, the young girl, Juliette Lewis, in the, uh, the school. And she was hanging on to a, a window ledge and then she almost falls and it's all very, very, um, uh, very much like a thriller, uh, yeah. but done, uh, people, other people could do it much better than me. I wasn't interested in that. I said, well, what if, instead of attacking her, what if chasing her and scaring her, what if there's something wrong with the family, in the sense that there's been some breach of trust with the mother and 
uh, Nick Nolte, there's nothing in, in, that he can do in his life that will ever put him in good standing again with his wife and also with his daughter. And so both women have contempt for him. And what if Max, Katie, undermines the very last bit of trust that his daughter has for him, for Nick Nolte, for her father, in this scene? What if he worms his way yeah, into that? And, that and, and seduces her that way uh, and destroys that well, level last faith she had in her father. I think it was a terrible thing that, that he would do. And that's the scene that Wesley Strick wrote, the writer who was with us. And we kept working on that scene every day. And we shot that in one take, uh, two cameras. And that's what you see in the film. Uh, the actors were just like this on it. And, they were, they were, and then, then, then we built everything from there. And then I tried to do a, um, a storm sequence. But before you storm sequence, on the other side, you also had the biting of the, of the uh, cheek, which was very violent and very yes. scary. Yeah. And that's added a lot to the tension of the Yeah, of yeah. The, that, that, the that people were very upset about. But the, 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 um, the, 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 the bad taste, the idea of pushing into the bad taste uh, is important for that kind of film and that, that genre. Um, and also... Uh, we read some, uh, some transcripts of court cases in America that were uh, under the uh, um, uh, cases involving what they call aggravated assault. And that's based on a case of what they call aggravated assault that actually happened. Wow. And he got away with it, too, by the way. Whoa. <laughs> that's yeah, even I, worse. We all looked at Nick Nolte and all of us, and Wesley and Strick and De Niro, we all looked at him and said, he got away with it. My God. It's horrible. And, yeah. and we said, this is, this is probably what has to be done. And... Um, uh, that was really uh, also experimenting with widescreen yep. first time and working with the great Freddie Francis, the director uh, of photography, but also a wonderful director of uh, um, uh, thrillers and horror films. Uh, but, but, well, anyway, to me, that was the most powerful scene, the one with the, uh, with Max Cady and the girl. That's the key, yeah. And, and having seen the horror of the, of the well, aggravated the assault before, yeah, the woman, yeah. then, of course, it makes her predicament and her danger that much greater because you've yeah, just seen yeah, these, these yeah, horrible yeah, things. Yeah. And, and to me, it's almost the ending looks like an anticlimax, so to speak. Yeah, I, I, that's, it, it, was, it was an example of, we, we, at that time too, there was, we weren't doing digital. We had, uh, it was getting into the actual craft of making a film. The boats were uh, in, um, I had one boat in a tank in Florida, but we had um, models of boats shot in London too, intercut it. I designed that entire sequence over 200 shots, all drawn by me. So it was really action filmmaking. Yeah. That was the idea. Based on the boxing scenes in Raging Bull, based on the music scenes in New York, New York, and some of Last Waltz too. Yeah. So, uh, uh, because the boxing scenes in Raging Bull eventually became music scenes. I didn't know how to shoot the boxing, except that I did this with music, that for a bar of music, in a song, let's say, by the, by the band called The Weight. Um, uh, for one bar, the camera would track from left to right into the close-up of the drummer who's singing, Lee Von Helm, let's say. He's singing. And a certain line of, of the lyric, the camera would be in a close-up by that point. And then you'd cut, and there wouldn't be any other coverage. Then we go to the next bar and two more bars of music. And so I did the same with the um, action in the ring. If there were four punches to the to, the, to the, the trunk and one to the face. I broke that maybe into four shots. There was no cover. There were no s double cameras or triple cameras. There was one camera all the time. It took 10 wow. weeks to do. So the, the boxing scenes were really choreography like music, you see. And so the action scene has always interested me. Then finally, um, I did that again in, I became enamored of it again with the aviator, the flying scenes in yes. the aviator. That was the action cinema that sometimes I like to play yes, with. Yes, yes. Uh, Aviator was a great success, and uh, as was The Departed and the other films later on. But since we're, we're into the discussion of technique, uh, you are known as the king of the tracking shot. No. And I've always been wanting to ask you a question whether you were at all influenced by the, uh, and I'll explain for a moment why, because by the very long opening tracking shot oh, of, touch of, of Wales on Touch of Evil. Mm -hmm. Because you also use uh, a lot of uh, music where the sources of the music are mm -hmm. on, on film. Mm -hmm. And apparently, uh, I've been told that uh, we've rediscovered a memo by Orson Welles objecting to the Henry Mancini score That's right. on that scene yeah, and yeah, saying yeah. that he just wanted the music to come 
from the, uh, the, the, yeah, the, that's right. the, the shops that's right. and the yeah. cantinas and so on as they're walking. Yeah. And this would be very much the kind of thing that I, I feel would, would appeal to you. Well, it certainly did, but you know, the, master, uh, the masters of the tracking shots are Murnau and Wells and Max Ophuls and Bertolucci. Uh, you know, these, are, these are the real masters of, of the camera, that, the crane shots. Um, anything that Bertolucci has done, you could see over the years, just an extraordinary use of camera movement. So for me, uh, two things. One, the music always had to come way I grew up, my life was scored by the music that I heard from the radio or from the jukeboxes that were playing in my neighborhood. So if there was opera coming from a radio, there was rock and roll coming from here, as I said earlier, swing music from there. And I would see these different things happen in the street or in my apartment. And so the music became the music score for me. Um, and uh, I didn't know how to do a score for a film. Really. I mean, I didn't understand how that could be. The only men I really, two, two men, Bernard Herrmann and Elmer Bernstein, I've been lucky uh, to work with. And there are different reasons why they did those films for me. But primarily, I usually use score that I create from music that I know. And uh, that comes from uh, just living it. Because when I started making films, the classical era of uh, Hollywood cinema was long gone. So we have to make films in a new way. And there was no reason why we couldn't do that. Even in Casino, for example, there's three hours of wall-to-wall -wall music that I designed, uh, including um, the theme from uh, Le Mépris, The Contempt, mm -hmm. by, by um, Delarue. We use the theme from another film. There's no reason why you couldn't do that. There's no reason why. I mean, it's part of, uh, part of our cinema culture. So um, uh, that's, that's one thing about the music. But as far as the tracking shot is concerned, um, I think the tracking shot you're talking about may be the one in Goodfellas, which is the With one Henry that goes Hill into the, the, uh, to the Copacabana. Yeah, the Copacabana, yes. That's, yeah. of course, your... Uh, that, that became uh, uh, people, uh, especially people who know that world and were in that, that nightclub, knew that that's the way it was at that time. Um, we'd get into that nightclub. We were maybe 17 or 18 years old. We'd get a table down in front. And we'd be sitting there saying, oh, it's great. We're going to watch the whole show right in front of us right here. And sure enough, the table would be coming and put some... A table come right in front of me, about four wise guys would be there. You couldn't say a thing. That was it. Yeah. You know? But um, the nature of that tracking shot was about the world that he was in, um, the world that he wanted to aspire to. He was treated like a king. And, and so the shot had to have a certain regal, elegant yes. nature to it. And that's why uh, we, we did it in one take. But it works extremely well. And uh, certainly uh, the mastery uh, has been uh, recognized and everybody considers that tracking shot uh, <laughs> going into the Copacabana as one of the, of the great shots. Uh, in film. I was just trying to figure out the influences that were on you when you were doing this. Well, whether, Max Ophuls in, in Le Plaisir. In Le Plaisir. Plaisir. Do you know the opening of yeah. the, uh, I think the second story, the man who wears a mask, so very, he's very old, but he goes out dancing all the time. I think it may be the first story, where the camera just tracks from outside inside, and it, he comes out of a taxi cab, of, of a hansom cab, and starts dancing on the floor, and the camera's tracking around. Uh, Ophuls' uh, camera movement is just so beautiful. Yes. And uh, uh, we weren't that, and I talk about Murnau. Uh, yes, now you see Murnau, but you have to understand that only 20 years ago, maybe 30 years ago, was the first time you saw silent films projected the right way. So it was very difficult to see Sunrise, or any of the films that he made in Germany. Yeah. Uh, in the 20s, in, in the right speed. So everything would be off. Now we see them in the right speed with the tinting. Uh, uh, and, in some cases, most of them are gone now, but whatever's left, we can see and well, appreciate better. That, that brings me, I mean, the, uh, you're right. And of course, you are a film historian, film critic, as well as a dedicated person in, in maintaining the, the, the legacy of old film. Uh, the work of, uh, of the early masters like Griffith with his uh, smooth transitions and Eisenstein with his uh, very oh, yeah. violent montage, but extremely powerful images. Uh, Potemkin, uh, you find echoes of it in uh, Brian De Palma's uh, Chicago oh, De Palma, uh, De Palma does incredible camera tracking. Yeah. Brian De Palma's long tracking shots, especially in The Untouchables, yeah. is amazing. But he, the influence of the of the baby carriage coming down the well, that's, almost that's Brian. Uh, almost he wanted to do Potemkin, yeah. Uh, almost a, a redoing of uh, Potemkin. Potemkin. Yes, uh, we told him. Said you're doing Potemkin. I know. <laughs> <laughs>
well, again, it's, again, for Brian, I, I, I could speak for him, I think, because it was the enjoyment of making that work, the craft, again. You see, taking an excuse and working that sequence. People have always uh, argued uh, with him about that. Well, on, on the craft, you've also used not only the traction, but slow motion. And I yes. think certainly uh, in Raging Bull, there's uh, uh, some of the fighting where you move into slow motion slow and you motion. see the impact of yeah. the punch coming the problem, in and all that. The problem there is that when Sam Peckinpah used slow motion, you can't really do... Peckinpah used it extraordinarily well for that type of action. What happened in Raging Bull was that sometimes the punches would go by so fast we couldn't see them. And so we had to, slow, we had to go high speed. And went higher and higher and higher until finally we'd see something. The rushes, watching the rushes were very funny. It was very funny. You don't have, we didn't have high speed at the time. You couldn't speed. So if, it was, if we're watching a glove go by, the face, Bob's face, and he turns this way and there's a, uh, some uh, reaction that comes out, like a, a supposedly a, a bit of uh, sweat or blood. Um, and if it was 120 frames a second, we'd have to watch maybe six or seven minutes of film and sit there. We're having lunch, eating. I think it's coming. <laughs> no, no, that's not yet. No, that's not the bright one. No. Oh, wait, wait. He, no, he, 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 no, no, okay. We, <laughs> we, had, we found the six frames out of ten minutes of film. The rushes were hours, you know. We thought, oh, this is murder. But yeah. that's mainly, mainly so we could see the action. You can see the action. And it's extremely action. powerful. Uh, but how about something unusual? Uh, I know, for example, that um, you use uh, strong white light in many occasions. But the part that, that I found very intriguing was the last shot in uh, Temptation, with, which has a fade oh, to white yeah. rather than a fade to black, which is quite unusual. Well, what happened is that the film ran out. The, um, uh, <laughs> the um, interesting... Now, <laughs> now you're shattering my illusions. No, I, no, no. I had this image of, of all this incredible... <laughs> Artistry going on. <laughs> I'll tell you what it is. What happened was that we had no time to shoot it, of course, and it's a crucifixion. It's the main scene. And he finally, he finally accepts. He says, it is consummated. He accepts to be the sacrifice. He accepts, in, 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 in the sense of the, uh, in the Christian tradition, the, uh, the Messiah. He accepts being the Messiah. It's very important. And what happened, we were shooting so fast, when they took the film out of the, uh, the camera, they opened the magazine a little bit by accident. And that was the take I liked. Uh, now we had the man on the cross. I said, I'm going to do it again. The light is going down. The sun is going down. We had no light. So we did it two more times. But in the rushes, I looked at it, and just as he said it is consummated, this image is yellow and blue and red started to come from the side. I said, this is beautiful. It yeah. reminded me of um, uh, some of the underground films, of, uh, not as great, of course, as what Stan Brackage would do or the men who would paint on film. And, you, and I said, well, this is it. This is transcendence. Is this transcendence. His, his and soul, his spirit, it uh, transcends. And, and the, uh, the, the fade to white was just so and then, powerful. Then it burst to white. Then and it burst it's to very white. powerful. Yeah, yeah. Very powerful. But and that was partially by accident. And then the, <laughs> the decision was to use that take. Well, you know? I, the artistry is in recognizing when the accident has been done. <laughs> that that's the right thing to do rather than try to redo it again. I think that's uh, uh, part of it, I think. Uh, the, 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 the other thing I think that uh, I also uh, wanted to ask you about, Gangs of New York. Uh, it's a film actually I've uh, recommended to many of my colleagues, uh, not only because it's a great film, uh, but because I believe, from my knowledge of American history, that leaving aside a few nitpickers who would say, well, that was 19, uh, 1856, yes, yeah, 1853, yeah, yeah. I know. I know. But, but it is a remarkably authentic film. Mm, mm, mm. It captures an era of uh, American life and New York life that most people, as you say, have the protagonist say in the end, most people will never They'll believe never we existed. We That's don't right. even know that we exist. Right. They don't know about Boss Tweed. They don't know about the, the Tammany Hall machine. They don't know about the five points. They don't know. Most people don't know that part of American history. But uh, you were challenged, I believe, because it was coming right after 9-11, or at least that's what we heard in the, in the, in the media, and uh, that they were asking you that you were showing a bad picture of New York history and so on. Although, if I remember correctly, and I think you showed the, in the riots, 
where the blacks uh, are being strung up yes, and burned, the, 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 you show it going into lithograph and coming yeah. from lithographs. That's right, that's right, because that actually, unfortunately, the riots turned into a, a race riot yeah. uh, immediately. Uh, it started out as a, a revolution and became a race riot. It was the worst rioting in American history yeah. in New York. The city was taken for five, four to five days by this horrible mob, hundreds of thousands of people. 1863. It was 1863. Yeah. And... Uh, uh, they were, they were from the five points. And it was, it's still, you see, the, the country had really, hadn't been formed. I mean, the revolution, uh, or the war against uh, England in, in the 1776 um, established the country, yes. But the nature of how everyone was going to live together as supposedly uh, the ideals of freedom, in a sense, uh, dealing with slavery, one couldn't, that could not be tolerated. Uh, the economics of the North versus the South had to be dealt with. And in a sense, the Civil War was really the formation of the country. I, I mean, that's a simplification. I'm not yeah, a historian. Yeah. But that really, but it's fomented in blood and sacrifice. Uh, it really, really was found that way. And uh, most of the people, no one will ever know about. And, and these gangs in the Five Points, though, um, uh, uh, thugs that they were, many of them were very political. And part of the reason that they formed gangs was because there was no other way for them to be heard. So they became uh, very forceful in the street. They would go to a theater and cause a riot in a theater, uh, at a play. And when I did the research over the years, I'd find that uh, uh, they'd be describing uh, a play and a riot, and they said, it started as your usual theater riot. <laughs> usual theater riot? I said, what the hell is that? You know? And then, said, well, then it turned into a, a massacre because so-and-so shot at somebody, and all these things. So we took these characters, all based on real characters of the time, and put them in a kind of fanciful setting. I don't say it's all, the story is accurate, but ultimately the blood vengeance means absolutely nothing because the army and the world and history comes in and wipes it all away. Yeah. And yet without them, that country wouldn't be there. Um, and also the nature of what it really was like to be an immigrant. Yes, and, and the how Irish, the Irish were, were, were The Irish were the first to come to America uh, in, in, mass, in a mass group, and they were, they were treated extraordinarily harsh, harsh way, uh, particularly because they were Catholic, and um, uh, eventually they became uh, uh, part of the government, the, uh, the uh, uh, politics and also the police force. And so when the Italians came over, it made it worse for the Italians because the Italians were not only Catholic, they couldn't speak English, and the Irish were in power, uh. and the Irish had fought for that power. So now the Italians could not get anywhere near that, see? So there's yeah. a lot of tension in my father's generation with, with yeah. the Irish. Not in, not in my generation, but uh, in 1920 and 1940s, uh, yeah. turn of the century, 1900, a lot of tension between the Italians and the Irish. Yeah, well, I mean, you know, uh, even in the, in the gangs from uh, Capone and company and Bugs Moran on the other oh, side. Yeah, yeah. So they were, yeah. But, but um, the film, therefore, was really, a, uh, you know, I, I think it was an extremely well-researched film. I thought the, the overall atmospherics of the film were extremely precise. We tried very, to be, yeah. Very, yeah. Very, yeah. So, so this is a, one of the projects you've always wanted to do yes, for a see, long I, time. See, one of the things was that I grew up in the remnants of the Five Points. Not only was it an Italian neighborhood, but right next to it was a place called the Bowery. And yeah. the Bowery was where all the uh, alcoholics, all the derelicts would just go and they were dying in the streets. So I grew up with them. I knew them. Um, when they were sober, they'd work for my grandfather, they'd work for friends of mine or whatever. Then they'd get drunk again, and, and it was horrible. It was absolutely a horrible experience. And uh, there were only a few Christian groups that would take care of them. Um, uh, smaller Protestant uh, Christians, uh, the Catholic Church was the best they could, but uh, it, was, it was not part of, they, they tried, my, our families tried to shield the young kids from this, from this uh, uh, suicidal uh, 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 spectacle, uh, but when it's literally, if you're here and it's right there, you can't be shielded from it. So that was the remnants of what the five points was like, and I grew up understand, knowing that and finding a lot of research about that neighborhood. And so it was something that I, I was needed to explore further and further and further. Uh, well, I, I have two more questions on uh, filmmaking. One is, of course, uh, the role of the producer. We talked about the scriptwriter, the cinematographer, the editor, uh, the, 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 uh, cinema, you know, the, the actors, 
the director, obviously. The producer. Is the producer a help or a hindrance? Well, the producer. <laughs> I, I get nervous when you say producer. <laughs> Jump. Um, uh, well, seriously, are producers people who enable directors to fulfill can. their vision? They, that's the idea. The, a good producer, or a producer you have a good relationship with, uh, with uh, him or her, you, they can make possible what you want, your vision, to use a, to use a, 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 a kind of pretentious term. But the idea is you see something a certain way. I need this piece of equipment for this shot. I need this piece of equipment. I need, this, I need 500 actors. I need 500, uh, I need 500 extras. You can't. You can have 20. <laughs> yeah. I said, all right, give me 35. Okay, 35. <laughs> <laughs> I see that we have more directors than producers yeah. in the audience. <laughs> but you work together. You work it out. It, 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 you work together. It's not a, if you have somebody who keeps saying no, 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 and you can't work with the person, that's the end of it. You can't. That, I mean, there's a way to even there. I mean, Taxi Driver, for example, we had hardly anything in a way. Um, very, very low budget. In Gangs of New York, we had practically everything in that sense, but it was still an extraordinarily difficult Film experience with the producers. Um, the script kept changing, and... Um, a lot of time, a lot of, there were big problems in the actual production. Uh, but that was a very special case. Uh, it was different. It was a, I think I may have even been too close to the material. I, for example, I think uh, I could still be shooting that film. There are uh -huh. more and more stories that go beyond that. Yes, uh, it's very and rich. We had it all there. We had it there. We had, you know. But Martin, if I may ask, you know, at the end of the day, is it the, the audience at large, or the critics, or your peers, or just your personal satisfaction that counts most. Because if we look at your career, uh, brilliant, uh, successful, uh, admired as it is by everybody in the, in the, uh, in the cinema business, uh, in terms of uh, big uh, box office receipts, uh, it, 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 these are not the films that... Uh, yeah. Uh, Cape Fear so made some money. Cape Fear yeah. did, did well. And I think, uh, oh, the last four films, Gangs of New York, uh, Aviator, uh, and Departed. Av and Departed. Big surprise. Now, The Departed. Yes. This is the film for which you finally received the long overdue Oscar, the Oscar. Uh, recognition. And I believe uh, your three cohorts, the four musketeers who changed Hollywood, the three of them came up oh, to right. give it to you. <laughs> uh, it was a great shot for all of us yes. movie buffs to see the four of you together, the three of them paying homage uh, to you. The three being, of course, George Lucas, Steven uh, Spielberg, and Francis Ford Coppola, paying homage to Marty Scorsese yeah. uh, the, for The Departed. Yes. Is, I mean, the, compared to the other films that we've been talking about, how does The Departed, I, I really in your no, judgment... I have no idea. My judgment, I became, I was so close to the film, and I wanted to get away from the film so, fa so badly because it became embroiled in, the, in the, I was adding to the story from the Chinese film, Infernal Affairs, uh, uh, this beautiful story of the complexities, again about betrayal, mm -hmm. and again about the young man trying to kill his father to a certain extent. Um, similar stories. I, I was shooting one scene, and Jack Nicholson looked at me and said, Marty, you did this scene already. And three other films, <laughs> said, you're right. Let's do it again. It was good. <laughs> <laughs> so... <laughs> we start laughing and do it. But the thing about the, thing about the Departed was a, um, I tried to, to build character into the plot to the point where the character scenes always tended to almost damage the plot in a way. And some people may say that actually still is the way the film is. It's, it's not, but we got as close as we could get, but it was really like wrestling with uh, the Hydra. That there was so, once we fixed one thing, another thing would happen. My, myself and Thelma and the editing took a long time. And uh, I had just started to make the film as a, a B film, as a, uh, uh, a noir, a modern day noir film. We had intended to make it a big. A blockbuster. <laughs> not a blockbuster. Um, Leo said, Leo DiCaprio said he wanted to be in it right away. I said, oh, great, okay, Leo, you know, because he'll do a street kid, it'd be very interesting. And then um, they suggested Matt Damon. I love Matt. Uh, I said, great. Then I said, well, in that case, you need somebody for the uh, Francis Costello. You need somebody uh, of a certain level. So I, I always wanted to work with Jack Nicholson, so we asked Jack. And then it became something, although the actual budget of the film, the actual shooting, was a moderate budget in terms yeah. of uh, Hollywood standards. 
Uh, but then the film became, uh, uh, I was surprised. I was shooting the Rolling Stones concert. I don't know what happened. I was, <laughs> seriously, a, a picture opened. Uh, it was about to open or something. I remember I was working and trying to work out what songs Mick Jagger was going to, and the, the Keith Richards were going to do. They weren't going to tell me. And so, um, you know, working on 12, 14 cameras there, getting all the best cameramen in the world, and to record them on, on stage. Uh, and that's when the film started to get a lot of notoriety, and, and uh, uh, so I just went with that. Well, we're delighted, and we're looking forward to seeing, of course, Shutter Island. Uh, I could uh, keep you here for hours. I'm sure our audience would stay for hours more, but uh, we are constrained a little bit by time, so I would like to, to give you some of the questions that came from the audience and uh, give you a chance uh, to uh, uh, answer them. Uh, the first one is about the production process, uh, film pro making a film. How can you keep the same spirit and the enthusiasm during the whole time? Or do you have ups and downs, or how do you do that? And what about when you have new ideas in the middle of the film? Uh, mm -hmm. Do you change, or do you say, that one will go for a future film, and? Uh, let me now focus on finishing this work. Well, I Which think the, the, the first part of the question is something where the energy, the director sets the energy of, of the picture. And so um, one of the reasons I find it difficult shooting is because I have to keep that energy going, and keep the crew moving, and keep the actors energized. Um, and I find that if I have a cameraman, a director of photography, and an assistant director who have the same spirit, the minute I start to, to, to weaken, they pull me, and we move forward. And this is uh, very important. Uh, Michael Ballhaus was good that way. Under the worst circumstances, he always said, we'll find a way. And he did. <laughs> you know, he taught me a lot. He said, you know, just be, be glad for what we have. Don't wish for anything else. This is what we have. We have nothing there. We thought we'd have this. We don't have it. We thought we'd have that. We don't have it. This is what we have. Let's work with it. You're right. Let's go. And so that's a very important thing, to have the people that closest to you uh, because you do get the ups and downs, are, are, the downs are, are very serious, uh, very, very difficult. And in terms of getting new ideas, it depends if it furthers the film, it depends what it means for the picture. You know, um, I think you, we try it. In the case of Departed, we, huh, we had so many new ideas. We kept writing with Bill Monaghan and Matt Damon and Leo and Jack uh, kept rewriting throughout, throughout the, and Vera Farmiga. She wrote, she helped write some of her scenes with Bill Monaghan. I mean, right, mm. working together with the writer, I should say. Mm. Very, very, and we, we kept um, her scenes to the very end, in fact, to work her character out. So that was a process that was never finished, really. Um, well, there's a lot of questions here that ask pretty much the same thing in different ways uh, about would you consider making a film in Egypt? Oh, wow. Of course I would. And, yeah. uh, of course I would. Again, again, it's the subject matter. Well, that's the next question, yeah. is, you know, we're here in Alexandria, and once upon a time, Alexandria was, well, two or three times in its history, the most interesting city in the world, that's the right. most exciting things in the world happening there. Would you consider uh, uh, a period like that to make a, a film? Well, that, that's a dream of mine always, yeah. I mean, I'm Alexandria? Obsessed, obsessed with that period, too. The ancient, You're talking, Alexandria, ancient, the ancient Cleopatra. period. Yeah, well, before that. Can I tell yeah. them a secret that uh, your middle name is Mark Antonio? Mark Antonio, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> it is true. It is it's true. true. Yeah. I'm not making it up. It really is true. Because Mark Antony gave Cleopatra, uh, Julius Caesar helped burn the old library. I know. And Mark Anthony gave her 200,000 scrolls, scrolls yeah. from Pergamon. Oh. So he has a very soft spot in our heart. Oh. <laughs> so Mark, oh. this, is, this is the story. That would be an amazing story. You Wouldn't know. that be? I, 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 from, from when I was a child, when I was not allowed to uh, play sports, they'd take me to the movie theater. And then I'd come home after school, and I would draw pictures. Uh, they were like storyboards. And they were basically about the ancient world, uh. all films about the ancient world. So this is something that I've always uh, wanted to do. I would well, dream of. Uh, would, uh, I think some of us are going to pursue this with you yes. and with your, your <laughs> office afterwards. Uh, the, the other question really is uh, about, uh, you know, we're very grateful that you took on the, the Mummy as a film to mm. restore, and we're very grateful for that. But would you have any views about contemporary Egyptian cinema? Well, I'm just now uh, becoming more aware of it. I've mm. seen... Uh, 
over the years, I've seen some Shaheen films, of course, and uh, mm. uh, I've seen uh, a number of, uh, of uh, the newer Egyptian cinema. I've, uh, I'm hoping to see more. I know there are directors here today. I'd love to see the films, um, and uh, I will look at them. Uh, and so to become more aware of uh, exactly what is, uh, what is, um, what is happening in, in terms of uh, Egyptian cinema today, and young directors, too. Because for me, the issue is, as you get older, it's time, the time you spend looking at something, um, because that's time that you need for yourself, usually. But I find that discovering, quote-unquote, or being um, exposed to uh, new ways of thinking and different ways of storytelling, um, uh, uh, it's something very exciting and inspiring to make my own pictures, you see. So therefore, I'm open to, to seeing as many as possible. Thank you. Well, thank you. There are, uh, the, the last two questions, I'm going to combine them into one because I think they're extremely important. And one is really a suggestion to answer the first. The first one is that we're now living through a fairly difficult period between uh, the West and the Muslim world, generally. And there was a question whether cinema could break the ice wow. between these two worlds. And the second question is really, do you think that you could help facilitate a way of academic collaboration between American film students oh, and Egyptian film yeah. students to work together on a joint project? Now, that would be a way, perhaps, of, of see, answering the, the, the question on the that, confrontation. That's, that's, a great, that's a great idea, you see. We have, uh, uh, we started this, this was, the impulse for this became the World Cinema Foundation, restoring films um, in, uh, from uh, different parts of the world. Um, because I go back, and I've said this many times, I go back to the time I saw Sajid Ray's film, Pate Panchali, on television in America. And um, I... I was watching the film, and I, I, I had already seen the Italian neorealist films. But I said, this is fascinating. I said, because this is about people that usually, in films about India, they're always in the background. Yeah. <laughs> Here's the British and the Americans up front, you know. Yeah. So I'm saying, this is fascinating. You know, that, and uh, uh, that became, I became aware that films made of, um, from the people within the culture, not from the West's point of view, but from the point of view of the, it, within the culture itself. This is what's going to be so valuable, I think, for not only uh, uh, for the past films, but for the future. And I think cinema is really, you know, people, whether, whether it's projected on a big screen, which be very rare in the future these days, the way it's going, or on an iPod or on a, your computer, the computer. Young people are seeing films on computer. You, you're able to see films from all around the world in different cultures. And this is what's going to help, I think, bring at least the beginning of an understanding and an appreciation of each other's culture and a respect for each other's culture. I think cinema could be a very, very strong and important tool. Well, uh, I think we've taken so much of your time. You've been so generous with your time. And uh, really, uh, ladies and gentlemen, it is a great privilege to thank Martin Scorsese, great artist, great director, and a great human being. <laughs> Marty, thank it's you. been a privilege. <laughs> thank you. Great. Very, very good. Thank you. Standing ovation. <laughs> from a thousand people. It's great. Excellent work. Excellent. Thank you very Excellent. much. We should look into this idea. Yes. Oh, very, very, good. Good. very good. We're having dinner in Yes, good. We'll talk tonight. Okay. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.